So we're kind of curious about who, if there's any new people who've shown up or anybody have anything that they just care to share with the group before we get started. I had a question. Yes, is that Edward? Yeah. Uh, so I've been on a uh, low sodium for the blood pressure. Um, but like all of a sudden, I'm just craving dill pickles. <laughs> um, how bad is that? Do you think, it, am I like, am, is my body missing something for me to like just suddenly have cravings like that? And how bad are pickles really? Just to have to look at the sodium content. If you're, you're used to having low salt foods, then it'll probably taste really salty. So you'd yeah, you just have to uh, maybe just have one pickle or something until you see how it affects you. I guess is my is my uh, recommendation. But um, but as long as you're eating a wide variety of foods, you're probably still getting enough sodium. Uh, I mean, the mo most of the sodium is in in processed foods. How are you How are you doing with the processed foods? Um, I've been trying to switch away, and been mostly successful. Well, good, good for you. Making really good progress. So um, if you're not eating uh, processed foods, you're probably getting very little sodium or salt in your diet. Um, you wanna make sure that you get enough iodine because um, you know iodized salt has um, been kind of a staple in some of the cereals and some of the other processed foods that we have or you might be used to using iodized salt and decide to stop it. So you wanna make sure you're getting about 150 micrograms of, of iodine on a daily basis, either from sea vegetables or through the salt intake that you're getting. Um, I haven't heard about the craving of pickles before over this. It's kind of a new issue. Um, but you know, you can have up to, <clears throat> Two thirds of a teaspoon of salt is about, I don't know, uh, 1500 milligrams a day. And um, if, if, you, if you don't have problems with your blood pressure, maybe you could even have a little more. Do you have any high blood pressure problems? Okay. Um, yeah, it's elevated a bit. Uh, okay, so if your blood pressure is elevated, then you do probably want to do a bit of salt restriction and, and no more than two thirds of a teaspoon a day. But the other issue, there are two other issues that you want to take into account for high blood pressure. One is you want to relax your arteries and let them heal so they remain um, pliant and um, will uh, don't get stiff. Like if you leave the water on, on your hose uh, mm -hmm. over summer, it tends to get stiff and can break easily. Uh, you, that's why you turn the water off and release the pressure. So you don't want high blood pressure, but uh, dark green leafies combined with your saliva produce nitric oxide, relax your arteries and keep you running clean. Esselstyn would say, do that six times a day, eat greens. Uh, half a handful, a handful of greens throughout the day to, to keep your arteries bathed in it. I haven't done that much, but if you had problems controlling blood pressure, it is a strategy. The other issue is oil. Oil causes an, a bit of an inflammatory reaction, which can cause your arteries to constrict. So if, if you're um, exposing yourself to processed oils. Uh, that means cooking with them or eating foods that have uh, oil on them. Uh, then uh, you may want to cut that back if you're having problems with your blood pressure. Okay. Charlie? Yes. Um, how much iodine did you say that we need? 150 micrograms a day. Now you can get that through sea vegetables if you eat enough of them. You can get that through, I don't know, Scott, you've dealt with uh, tablets before over the counter yeah. iodine. Yeah, they're just kelp, they're vegan kelp uh, tablets. That's what I take because I just don't eat sea vegetables often enough to be a reliable source. And I, 
and I don't, and then I'm pretty salt sensitive, so I don't add salt to my food. So I, I choose to take a, a kelp supplement. And, and it's, it, it's, yeah, I think it's 150, just like Charlie said. And it's, it's not more is better. Uh, 150 right. should be what you should take. You shouldn't be taking 300, 500. That's not a healthy choice. Do, uh, and uh, Kim writes, go ahead. Uh, do, is broccoli considered a, a leafy green? Yes, it is. Okay. Broccoli, uh, kale, arugula, um, uh, chard, spinach, um, collard greens, um, red leaf lettuce, or just uh, green leaf loose lettuce. But the darker the green, probably the best. So kind of get used to some kale, some chard, some some collard greens are good because they're pretty high in calcium. Oh, well, that's why you come to these classes, right? <laughs> We're gonna keep encouraging you along the path. Uh, Kim says you can make homemade pickles are very easy to make without salt, just vinegar and dill. Uh, I've never made homemade pickles like that, but I don't know if it's the pickles you're craving or the salt you're craving. Right, yeah. I don't know. I'll have to try. <laughs> Actually, okay. sounds fun. I might do that. Sounds like if you're not eating any processed food, you could probably have a little pickle. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I have a comment on iodine. Go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, due to my background in uh, nuclear uh, power, uh, a lot of these prepper people, these uh, people that are worried about the apocalypse, say that if there's a nuclear war, there's going to be a lot of radioactive iodine in the atmosphere, and it's best if you don't have a deficiency of iodine in your body because you'll be absorbing the bad stuff. So they recommend keeping some iodine tablets handy in case the big bombs go off. You want to uh, make sure you have plenty of iodine from a safe source and that'll protect, protect your body from absorbing the bad stuff. <laughs> Any ideas about that? I think that's a good idea. It deals with one issue. If we actually have a nuclear war, I don't know whether uh, we're gonna all survive that or not <laughs> with a bottle of iodine tablets, but for your thyroid, yes, it is good for protection. Any thoughts, Scott? Yeah, actually, I can't remember what movie that was I watched. <laughs> it, was the, it was about Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Did you guys see that movie? They talked about that. They're giving everybody iodine. The, the nuclear scientist was taking iodine and so I kind of forgotten about that, but yeah, I heard, that's true. Yeah, less less chance of absorbing the radiation through your thyroid gland if you take the iodine. But yeah, it's like, do we want to? Is it a world we want to live in? If <laughs> would you rather just be vaporized or, <laughs> yeah. or live in a world with the, all the sickness, all the radiation sickness? I don't know. <laughs> Scary thought. Anyone else? So let's see if there's anybody, anybody new uh, in the group, uh, could you, would you care to unmute and tell us how you found out about the sessions? And then we're just kind of curious about that. Yeah, I'm new and I'm from Roseburg and my doctor recommended it. Well, Carol, we're <laughs> very happy to have you. Uh, we're thrilled that your doctor recommended it. I know Roseburg has classes of their own that are, um, I think, online and in person. Uh, I actually started those classes many years ago, like about, uh, I don't know, nine years ago or so, getting close to 10. But I'm really happy that someone encouraged you to get online here to give you some extra help. Are you in the Eugene area or down in Roseburg? Dan and Roseburg. Okay. Well, uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, we're trying to spread the word throughout the state and the world. We have people from back east uh, who attend these classes with us. And uh, are you familiar with our online site? 
Uh, you want to unmute your um, uh, microphone? Just click that little microphone in the bottom. I'm just yeah, I'm just getting used. I'm just getting acquainted with it. Okay, because all of our sessions uh, in the evening are are uh, archived, videotaped, and archived, so you can kind of go back and look at the topics that you might be particularly interested in. And the other thing that uh, you and the others need to be aware of is if you find that you need some individual help, you find that the classes are good to attend, but you just have some other questions that you're not comfortable addressing or uh, you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I'm more than willing to do that. It's free. Uh, and uh, some people say, I don't want to talk to the doctor. Um, I want to talk to someone else. So we have the medical student who uh, has been doing this for, I don't know, uh, over a year, um, helping people um, uh, achieve their goals. Uh, the medical student, if she doesn't know uh, the answer, will talk with me a bit and we'll discuss it and then uh, she'll get back with you. So there are options for additional help should you find that you need that. Okay. And it's free. Wonderful. Okay. Glad to have you. Anyone else? Can you guys hear me? Kate, yes. Kate, you can Hi. go ahead. Talk. I'm, I'm Kate. I uh, just started talking to Bosch Nutrition today and they told me about you guys. So I figured I'd hop on and Say hi. <laughs> hey, well, Kate, we love Bosch Nutrition. Bosch mm -hmm. Nutrition uh, is effectively uh, promoting exactly what we're promoting, and that's a whole food plant-based lifestyle. And they're wonderful people. We're thrilled to hear that they're referring you to class because you can go through their uh, nutrition classes and then uh, needing some extra support. That's what these classes are all about, to help you uh, be connected with others who have similar uh, goals in mind. So welcome, and uh, we're happy to have you. Thank you. Anyone else? I can, show, I can show, yeah, we're going to show that the website real quick. And yeah, so Scott is going to go ahead and uh, share with you all the website, do a quick little scan for those new members. And, um, you know, it's a wonderful addition that he keeps up uh, uh, and can be really helpful to you, those you love, uh, and your other friends who maybe don't love so much, but still would <laughs> like them to. Um, be healthy for themselves and for the world in general. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, so here's the class website at livelifestylemedicine.com. And uh, if you've signed up for the newsletter, which you can do right here, uh, I think some of the, I think the new people have already signed up. Be sure if you haven't received, if you don't receive the welcome newsletter, as soon as you sign up, you should receive a welcome newsletter. And if you don't, be sure to check your junk file because that happens a lot. Uh, so make sure you should get a, a welcome email as well as every Sunday morning, you should get a, a, a class email or newsletter. So if you don't get it, definitely check your junk file. And then you can access the class by clicking the link here, um, which you, you probably, some of you already did. So that's there. And then you just click, here's the link right, that we're at right now. So there's that. And then if you're new to the website, then go to, let's see, oop, I meant to get rid of that. Go to, um, on this homepage, scroll down here, website tutorial. And I just recorded a new one on Sunday. So uh, it's the most up to date. So watch this, it's about 17 minutes long. And I give you a full tour of all the resources that are available on the website. So check that out. And then I wanted to show you guys, actually, let me go back to my email. I wanted to show you the class newsletter from this week. Cause I don't know if you noticed, I posted the, um, let me go put this in here. Here it is. No, that's not it. Um, let's see, where's this week's class? Your life is getting about as complicated <laughs> as mine. Yeah, I know. Let's see. Oh, here it is. 
<laughs> Here's the email from just a couple days ago. So this is what the email looks like every Sunday morning. And so I don't know if you guys noticed uh, under upcoming events here, I posted, so the uh, nutrition and medicine class that Charlie is doing for the medical students uh, a week ago last Wednesday, so almost two weeks ago now, uh, we had he had the first the first class for the medical students and it's recorded and you can watch it right here by clicking this link here. And it's it's a it's great it's, uh, two hours long. There's I, I tell my story there. There's a bunch of other people from this class that told their stories here. There was actually 15 people that told their stories and uh, really inspiring. So I highly encourage you guys to watch that. And it was again geared for the for the medical students at Western University, the osteopathic medical school. And and we're trying to trying to uh, influence a whole new generation of medical providers to use food as medicine, use lifestyle medicine, and, and just to inspire them. And uh, Charlie did a really good job of moderating that. Anything you want to add to that, Charlie? No, I think you said it all, Scott. That's uh, I encourage you all to kind of take a listen if you want to get inspired about uh, some stories that will, you know, they, some of them may sound unbelievable to you, but they're all genuine from real people. It's their real stories. And um, anyway, we encourage you to log on to that. Okay, you all came for what reason? You want to know about fasting, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. because it's in the news and it's like, I don't know, you know, I wasn't so excited about listening to something about fasting because I don't like to be hungry. I, I mean, really, you know, you get, uh, we've all had an episode where we got over hungry and we're famished and it's not a very good feeling. But the question is, is are there some benefits to fasting? And so tonight we're going to kind of do an exploration as to uh, whether there are benefits to fasting. But we're also going to see do you have to fast like, you know, don't eat anything for a week or three days. Or could you do periods of food restriction throughout the day, which may be helpful or beneficial to you? without suffering the uh, severe distress connected with your thought process and how horrible that would be not to eat for a while. And so anyway, uh, we have a number of videos for you and we'll kind of run through them. We'll try to stop intermittently to see if there are any questions that you might have. I think I have 45 minutes of videos, which would give us 10 minutes of question. I don't think we'll get through all the videos, but we're going to get through a number of them. Uh, and if you have questions, feel free to ask them. And I have a couple, uh, at least one that uh, Scott wants us to show. And and uh, I I'm going to be sure to show that if we haven't shown it by eight o'clock, we'll we'll share it. Uh, <laughs> and then we have one more also that we need at least a couple after eight. So we're going to start out with. I don't know if it's kind of myth, it's not really a myth, but it's the 3,500 calorie per pound rule. You know, we're talking about probably fasting for what? Weight loss, so we're concerned about our calorie intake. And so I'm gonna kind of share this first video with you. And Charlie, don't let me forget at the end, I'll, I'll show on the website. I should have done it when I was already on the website, but I have the fasting infographic. That's a good summary of all the different types of fasting uh, from Dr. Gregor. I have it on, posted on the website. I'll, I'll show that at the end. Okay, we'll make sure we do that by 8.15, let's say. How's that? Okay, sure. Uh, fair enough. So you can see my screen? Yep. Okay, then we're gonna go to fasting. So where is fasting? We got to find a file here, and the file should be under what? Backup, tip classes. Uh, let's see. Uh, tip classes. Fasting. How good is that? We found it. Let's raise this up a little bit, and we're going to go the 3,500 calorie per pound rule. Let's check it out.
The first surgical attempt at body sculpting was in 1921, with a dancer wanting to improve the shape of her ankles. The surgeon apparently scraped away too much tissue and tied the stitches too tight, resulting in necrosis, amputation, and the first recorded malpractice suit in the history of plastic surgery. Today's liposuction is much safer, only killing about 1 in 5,000 patients, mostly from unknown causes, uh, throwing a clot off into your lung or perforations of your internal organs. Liposuction currently reigns as the most popular cosmetic surgery in the world, and its effects are indeed only cosmetic. A study published in the New England Journal of Medicine assessed obese women before and after having about 20 pounds of fat sucked out of their bodies, resulting in nearly a 20% drop in their total body fat. Normally, lose even just 5 to 10% of your body weight in fat, and you get significant improvements in blood pressure, uh, blood sugars, inflammation, cholesterol, and triglycerides, but liposuction sucks. None of those benefits materialized even after the massive liposuction. This suggests subcutaneous fat. The fat under our skin is not the problem. The metabolic insults of obesity arise from the visceral fat, the fat surrounding or even infiltrating our internal organs, like the fat marbling our muscles and liver. The way you lose that fat, the dangerous fat, is to take in fewer calories than you burn. Anyone who's seen the Biggest Loser shows knows with enough calorie restriction and exercise, hundreds of pounds can be lost. Similarly, there are cases in the medical literature of what some refer to as super-obesity, in which individuals lost up to 374 pounds largely on their own without professional help and kept it off for years. The guy lost about 20 pounds a month, cycling two hours a day and reducing intake to 800 calories a day, which is down around what some prisoners were getting at concentration camps in World War II. Perhaps America's most celebrated TV weight loss was when Oprah pulled out a wagon full of fat representing the 67 pounds she lost on a very low-calorie diet. How many calories did she have to cut to achieve that within four months? Consult leading nutrition textbooks, or refer to trusted authorities like the Mayo Clinic, and you'll learn the simple weight loss rule. One pound of fat is equal to 3,500 calories. Quoting from the Journal of the American Medical Association, a total of 3,500 calories equals one pound of body weight. This means if you decrease your intake by 500 calories daily, you will lose one pound per week. Uh, 500 calories per day times seven days equals 3,500 calories, so one pound of body fat. The simple weight loss rule, that's simply not true. The 3,500 calorie rule can be traced back to a paper in 1958 that just noted that since fatty tissue on the human body is 87% fat, a pound of body fat would have about 395 grams of pure fat. Uh, multiply that by 9 calories per gram of fat gives you that uh, 3,500 calories per pound approximation. The fatal flaw that leads to dramatically exaggerated weight loss predictions is that the 3,500 rule fails to take into account the fact that changes in the calories inside of the energy balance equation automatically lead to changes in calories out. Uh, for example, the slowing of metabolic rate that accompanies weight loss, known as metabolic adaptation. Uh, that's one of the reasons weight loss plateaus. Uh, for example, imagine a 30-year-old sedentary woman of average height who weighs 150 pounds. According to the 3500 calorie rule, if she cuts 500 calories out of her daily diet, she'd lose a pound a week, or 52 pounds a year. In three years, then, she would vanish. She'd go from 150 pounds to negative 6. Obviously, that doesn't happen. What would happen is that in the first year, instead of losing 52 pounds, she'd likely lose only 32 pounds, and then after a total of three years, stabilize at about 100 pounds. This is because it takes fewer calories to exist as a thin person. Part of it is simple mechanics. In the same way a Hummer requires more fuel than a compact car, think how much more effort it would take to just get out of a chair, walk across the room, or climb a few stairs carrying a 
50-pound backpack. That's no lighter than carrying 50 pounds in the front. Even when you're lying at rest sound asleep, there's simply less of your body to maintain as we lose weight. Every pound of fat tissue lost may mean one less mile of blood vessels your body has to pump blood through every minute. So the basic upkeep and movement of thinner bodies takes fewer calories. So as you lose weight by eating less, you end up needing less. That's what the 3500 calorie rule doesn't take into account. Or imagine it the other way. A 200-pound man starts eating 500 more calories a day. That's like a large soda or two donuts. According to the 3500 calories rule, in 10 years he'd weigh more than 700 pounds. That doesn't happen because the heavier he is, the more calories he burns just existing. If you're 100 pounds overweight, that's like the skinny person inside you trying to walk around balancing 13 gallons of oil at all times, or, or lugging around a sack containing 400 sticks of butter wherever you go. It takes about two donuts worth of extra energy just to live at 250 pounds, and so that's where he'd plateau out if he kept it up. So weight gain or weight loss, given a certain calorie excess or deficit, is a curve that flattens out over time rather than a straight line up or down. Nevertheless, the 3500 calorie rule continues to crop up, even in obesity journals. Public health researchers used it to calculate how many pounds children might lose every year if, for example, fast food kids' meals swamped in apple slices instead of french fries. They figured two meals a week could add up to about four pounds a year. The actual difference, National Restaurant Association funded researchers were no doubt delighted to point out, would probably add less than half a pound, ten times less than the 3,500 calorie rule would predict. The original article was subsequently retracted. So we started with this. We started with this article or this information about calories because, you know, I know myself, I've been under that assumption that 3,500 calories is about a pound of weight loss. And I thought it was kind of interesting why people will start losing weight and then they'll kind of plateau. And, you know, they're eating healthier and, you know, why do they stop? And I hope that you, the explanation he gave was good for you. Now, so you say, okay, if just restricting your calories is not enough, are there other ways in which you can kind of achieve weight loss other than just? restricting your calorie intake, and we're going to talk about that. And anybody have any questions about this so far? All right. Maybe it was a surprise. Maybe it wasn't. But now we're going to go on to some of the benefits of fasting, and uh, we'll go into that next. So the benefits of calorie restriction for longevity is the next one. And where is that? Should be over here. Though a bane for dieters, a slower metabolism may actually be a good thing. We've known for more than a century that calorie restriction can increase the lifespan of animals, and the metabolic slowdown may be the mechanism. That could be why the tortoise lives 10 times longer than the hare. Rabbits can live 10 to 20 years, whereas Harriet, a tortoise evidently collected from the Galapagos by none other than Charles Darwin himself in the 1830s, lived until 2006. Slow and steady may win the race. One of the ways your body lowers your resting metabolic rate is by creating cleaner burning, more efficient mitochondria, the power plants that fuel our cells. It's like your body passes its own fuel efficiency standards. These new mitochondria create the same energy with less oxygen and produce less free radical exhaust. After all, your body is afraid famine is afoot, and so is trying to conserve as much energy as it can. 
The largest caloric restriction trial to date indeed found both metabolic slowing and a reduction in free radical-induced oxidative stress, both of which may slow the rate of aging. The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. But whether this will result in greater human longevity is an unanswered question. Caloric restriction is often said to extend the lifespan of every species studied, but that isn't even true of all strains within a single species. Some scientists don't think calorie restriction will improve human longevity at all. Others suggest a 20% calorie restriction starting at age 25 and sustained 52 years could add five years onto your life. Either way, the reduced oxidative stress would be expected to improve our health span. Members of the Calorie Restriction Society, self-styled cronies for calorie-restricted optimal nutrition, appear to be in excellent health, but they're a rather unique self-selected bunch of individuals. You don't really know until you put it to the test. Enter the Calorie Study, the comprehensive assessment of long-term effects of reducing intake of energy, the first clinical trial to test the effects of caloric restriction. Hundreds of non-obese men and women were randomized to two years of 25% calorie restriction. They only ended up achieving half that, but lost about 18 pounds and 3 inches off their waists, uh, wiping out more than half of their visceral abdominal fat. That translated into significant improvements in uh, cholesterol levels, triglycerides, insulin sensitivity, and blood pressures. 80% of those who were overweight when they started were normal weight by the end, compared to a 27% increase in those who became overweight in the control group. In the famous Minnesota starvation study that used conscientious objectors as guinea pigs during World War II, the study subjects suffered both physically and psychologically, experiencing depression, irritability, and loss of libido. The subjects started out lean, though, and had their calorie intake cut in half. The calorie study ended up being four times less restrictive, only about 12% below baseline calorie intake, and enrolled normal weight individuals, which in the U.S. these days means overweight on average. As such, the calorie subjects experienced nothing but positive quality of life benefits, with significant improvements in mood, general health, sex drive, and sleep. They only ended up eating about 300 fewer calories than they were eating at baseline. So they got all these benefits, the physiological benefits, the psychological benefits, all from only cutting about a snack-sized bag of chips worth of calories from their daily diets. What happened at the end of the trial, though? In the Minnesota Starvation Study, and calorie deprivation experiments done on Army Rangers, as soon as subjects were released from restriction, they tended to rapidly regain the weight, and sometimes even more. The leaner they started out, the more their body seemed to drive them to overeat to pack back on the extra body fat. In contrast, after the completion of the calorie study, even though their metabolism was slowed, they retained about 50% of the weight loss two years later. Uh, they must have acquired new eating attitudes and behaviors that allowed them to keep their weight down. After extended calorie restriction, for example, cravings for sugary, fatty, and junky foods may actually go down. Oh. I'm blocking the screen there, Charlie. <laughs> okay, that's uh, someone asked for um, for us to do closed captioning, so I just uh, agreed to do that. So the benefits of calorie restriction. Uh, uh, what can we say other than um, as long as you are not underweight, uh, there are definitely benefits for uh, losing weight. And so that's one of the benefits, uh, potentially, of fasting. And so we are going to go uh, next to the benefits of fasting for healing. And let's see where that is, uh, the benefits of fasting for healing. The story of life on Earth is a story 
of starvation. Ash from massive volcanoes and asteroids block out the sun, killing the plants which then killed most everything else. As Darwin pointed out, though, from this war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object that we are capable of conceiving arose, namely us. We are particularly well adapted to prolonged fasting. Evolving in a context of scarcity is believed to have shaped our exceptional ability to store large amounts of calories when food is available. Of course, now our ability to easily pack on the pounds is leading to modern diseases like obesity and type 2 diabetes, but without the ability to store so much body fat, we may not have made it to tell the tale. And it's not just asteroids millions of years ago. All of Upper Egypt was dying of hunger. Reads an inscription on an Egyptian tomb from about 4,000 years ago, uh, to such degree that everyone had come to eating his children. Or just hundreds of years ago, parents killed their children, and children killed their parents and ate them. The bodies of executed criminals were eagerly snatched from the gallows, wiping out as many as two-thirds of the population of Italy, one-third of the population of Paris. Uh, so we don't have to go back to ancient history. Even the most secure and affluent populations of today need only trace their history back a short distance. For example, nearly 200 famines in Britain over the last 2,000 years. <laughs> Oops, what, ha what happened there? <laughs> uh, You're not sharing anymore. Years ago. I mean, if our physiology Thanks. is so well tuned to periodic starvation, maybe by eliminating that we may be doing harm to our overall well-being. We just didn't know. The lack of research in the area of starvation was attributed to the difficulty of securing willing human subjects. So what little we had came from unwilling subjects. Physicians within the Warsaw Ghetto made detailed accounts before they themselves succumbed. Or Irish Republican prisoners starving themselves to death after up to 73 days on hunger strike. But starvation isn't necessarily the same as fasting, an issue raised in medical journals over a century ago. Starvation is normally a forced, mentally stressful, and chronic condition, whereas therapeutic fasting is voluntary, uh, limited in duration, and usually practiced by people who you know, start out with adequate nutrition. Therapeutic fasting? Where did we get this idea of fasting therapy, fasting for medical purposes? Well, it may have originally rose out of the observation that when people get acutely ill, they tend to lose their appetite. So maybe there's something in the body's wisdom to stopping eating. Uh, that's presumably where the whole you know, starve a fever folklore came from. Uh, there was the sense that fasting forwards physiologic rest for the body, uh, not just the digestive tract, but throughout, uh, allowing the body to concentrate on healing. It was evidently an open secret that veterinarians used to hospitalize dogs only to fast them back to health. And so maybe, the theory went, it might work for people too. Beyond just freeing up all the resources that would normally be used for nutrient digestion and stores, there's this concept that during fasting our cells switch over to some sort of protection mode. Why would fasting reduce free radical damage and inflammation and bolster cellular protection? It's the that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger concept known as hormesis. Uh, so that's kind of the opposite of the let the body rest theory. It's more like let the body stress. Uh, the stress of fasting may steal the body against other stresses coming your way. This was demonstrated perhaps most starkly in a set of cringe-worthy experiments in which mice were blasted with Hiroshima-level gamma radiation sufficient to kill 50% within two weeks. But if the mice would first been intermittently fasted for six weeks before, not a single one died. It's this kind of dramatic data that led to you know, extraordinary claims like therapeutic fasting could drive half of all doctors out of business. But you don't know until you put it to the test, which we'll explore next. All right, so maybe you're getting the idea that maybe there is some benefit to uh, therapeutic fasting. Uh, this week, uh, Dr. Greger had a video, which I want to share with you next, and it's called Fasting Before and After Chemotherapy. 
could this actually um, improve results? So let's see what he has to say. The first randomized prospective clinical evaluation of the effects of fasting on chemotherapy, the incidence of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting in cancer patients, was published in 2014. But the patients were dogs. Cancer-bearing dogs presenting at a veterinary hospital were randomized to be fasted for 24 hours before chemotherapy, and those that were were significantly less likely to suffer from vomiting, only 1 in 10 compared to 2 out of 3 in the non-fasted group, which is great, but what can that tell us about human medicine? Evidently, not much. It's nearly impossible to rely on most animal data to predict whether or not an intervention will have a favorable clinical benefit-risk ratio in human subjects. For example, mice have a metabolic rate approximately seven times higher than humans, so a single day of fasting can cut lean body mass about 15%. It would take over a month of fasting in people, uh, so that dramatic study on mice showing 100% alive versus 100% dead on high-dose chemo, depending on whether they were fasted for 60 hours, uh, what can that really tell us? And when it comes to cancer, rodents can bear massive tumor loads, whereas people uh, generally uh, waste away and die when tumor masses reach just a thousandth of our body weight. You can't even necessarily extrapolate from one rat to another, even within the same strain bought from different dealers. The only way to see what happens in humans, the only way to guarantee findings are relevant, is to study people. Uh, the theory is that combining fasting cycles with chemotherapy could extend the survival of advanced stage cancer patients by both retarding tumor progression and reducing side effects, or even providing an alternative to chemotherapy altogether in early stage cancer patients, but uh, that's all contingent on it being confirmed in human clinical trials. First, there were case series. Several patients diagnosed with a variety of cancers elected to undertake fasting prior to chemotherapy and shared their experiences. Those who underwent chemo both with and without fasting reported a reduction of fatigue, weakness, and gastrointestinal side effects while fasting. In fact, felt better across the board with zero vomiting, in the fasting group, uh, the weight loss during the first few days of fasting was rapidly recovered in most of the patients and did not lead to any detectable harm. So overall, was looking feasible, safe, with the potential to ameliorate side effects. But only randomized clinical studies could tell for sure, and so here we go. Breast and ovarian cancer patients fasting, starting 36 hours before and ending 24 hours after chemotherapy, and it did appear to improve the quality of life and fatigue, uh, but another study found no such beneficial effects. Uh, there did appear to perhaps be less bone marrow toxicity, given the higher counts of red blood cells and platelet-making cells, but no benefit when it came to killing off white blood cells, the immune system cells, so that was a disappointment. Perhaps they didn't fast long enough. They only fasted 24 hours before and after. To find out the optimal duration, 20 cancer patients were split up into three groups, fasting for 24, 48, or a total of 72 hours. All those in the 24-hour group suffered nausea after chemo, but less than half in the 72-hour group. And most were vomiting in the 24-hour group, but none in the longest fasting group. Longer fasting groups also tend to suffer less nerve damage and less serious bone marrow suppression. Even after 24 hours of fasting, two cycles of chemo can knock people's white blood cells down to suboptimal levels, but with 72 hours, chemo knocked their immune system down, but not out. Okay, so short-term fasting may reduce chemotherapy-induced toxicity, but what I want to know is if it makes it work better. A systematic review of 22 studies found that overall fasting was found to not only reduce chemotherapy side effects like organ damage, immune suppression, and chemotherapy-induced death, but also to suppress tumor progression, including tumor growth and metastases, resulting in improved survival, but nearly all the studies were done on lab animals. The studies on humans are limited to evaluating safety and side effects. 
the tumor suppression effects of fasting, for example, its influence on tumor growth, metastases, and prognosis, have not been evaluated until now to be continued. So that was this week that he sent that, and so it'll be to be continued, uh, which means I don't have the answer. Uh, but it looks promising, and uh, perhaps, um, you know, fasting for a longer period before you are receiving chemotherapy might reduce your nausea, might reduce tumor growth later on. Uh, it's currently being studied, and it's kind of interesting at a minimum. Any questions? I know it's more than a mouthful. Uh, he can go pretty fast at times. And, uh, you know, um, what can I say? If you just pick up a little bit here and there and say, okay, let's say there can be some benefits. Do you have any other uh, information which might be of some sort of interest? So we're going to go to, what's this? Uh, biblical Daniel fasting. Uh, for those of you who are interested, it's a two-minute video. It's short, and here it is. Evidently not completely satisfied with the scientific rigor of the dietary trial presented in Daniel 1, 8 through 16, researchers in Tennessee published two papers recently detailing a series of parallel experiments on a 21-day all-you-can-eat diet devoid of animal products and preservatives, and inclusive of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. In other words, food intake in accordance with a stringent vegan diet. The purpose of the studies were to determine the effect of a 21-day Daniel fast on both biomarkers of antioxidant status and oxidative stress, as well as the efficacy of the Daniel fast to improve markers of the lion's den of metabolic and cardiovascular disease risk. No surprise that a diet composed of whole plant foods improves several risk factors for metabolic and cardiovascular disease, as well as an improvement in selected biomarkers of antioxidant status and oxidative stress, including metabolites of nitric oxide, which I've talked about before. Participants experienced meaningful improvements in blood pressure, cholesterol, insulin levels, insulin resistance, and C-reactive protein were all lowered to a clinically meaningful extent. And this was in a young, healthy population. Imagine the miracles it could do for people who are really hurting. This study extends the findings of other plant-based diets by documenting the impact of a strict vegan diet on multiple measures of oxidative stress and antioxidant capacity. Of course, if instead of a biblical Daniel fast, they had called it a strict vegan diet, they probably would not have gotten a compliance rate of 98.7%, especially in Tennessee. So we must be careful of the words we use and how we phrase what we're doing, because it may turn some people off, for sure. Um, and let's see, so I have two more vid videos that I want to share with you, and then uh, we're going to call it uh, quits from my end, maybe three, but probably two. The benefits of early time restricted weight loss. So let's see what this has to say on the benefits of early time restricted. Uh, let's see, that's not quite the one that I wanted. The benefits of early restricted. There's a couple videos that are pretty much the same. Uh, calorie restrictive for benefits of calorie restriction. Uh, maybe it is that. Uh, benefits of chemotherapy. Intermittent, alternate day, alternate day. Restricted eating. Well, I guess what? I guess I wrote the wrong thing down. <laughs> it's the benefits of early time restricted eating. Let's see what this is.
time-restricted feeding, where you try to squeeze the same amount of eating into a narrow evening window, has benefits compared to eating in the evening and earlier in the day, but also has adverse effects because you're eating so much so late. The best of both worlds was demonstrated in 2018, time-restricted feeding into a narrow window earlier in the day. Individuals randomized to eat the same food, but just in an 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. eating window, experienced a drop in blood pressures, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance, even when all the study subjects were maintained at the same weight. Same food, same weight, but with different results. The drops in blood pressures were extraordinary, from 123 over 82 down to 112 over 72 in five weeks, uh, comparable to the effectiveness of potent blood pressure drugs. The longest study to date on time-restricted feeding only lasted 16 weeks, a, a pilot study with no control group that only involved eight people, but the results are still worth noting. Overweight individuals who, like most of us, were eating more than 14 hours a day were instructed to stick to a consistent 10- to 12-hour feeding window of their own choosing. On average, they were able to successfully reduce their daily eating duration by about four and a half hours, and within 16 weeks they had lost seven pounds. They also reported feeling more energetic and sleeping better. This may help explain why all participants voluntarily expressed their interest in continuing the time-restricted feeding on their own, even after the study ended. You don't often see that after weight loss studies. Even more remarkable, eight months later they retained their weight loss and improved energy and sleep. At the one-year point, maintained their boosted energy and sleep, and kept the weight off, all from one of the simplest of interventions, just telling people to stick to a consistent 10- to 12-hour feeding window of their own choosing. How did it work? Even though they weren't told to change nutrition quality or quantity, they appeared to unintentionally eat hundreds of fewer calories a day. With self-selected time frames, you wouldn't necessarily think to expect circadian benefits, but because subjects were asked to keep the eating window consistent throughout the week, metabolic jet lag could be minimized. The thinking is that because people tend to start their days later on weekends, that's disrupting their circadian rhythm. And indeed, it's like they flew a few time zones west on Friday evening and flew back east on Monday morning, so some of the metabolic advantage may actually be due to maintaining a more regular eating schedule. Early or midday time-restricted feeding may have other benefits as well. Prolonged nightly fasting with reduced evening food intake has been associated with lower levels of inflammation and better blood sugar control, both of which might be expected to lower the risk of diseases such as breast cancer. So data was collected on thousands of breast cancer survivors to see if nightly fasting duration made a difference. Those who couldn't go more than 13 hours every night without eating had a 36% higher risk of cancer recurrence. These findings have led to the suggestion that efforts to avoid eating after 8 p.m. and fast for 13 hours or more overnight may be a beneficial consideration for those patients looking to decrease cancer risk and recurrence, though we'd need a randomized controlled trial to know for sure. Early time-restricted feeding may even play a role in the health of perhaps the longest living population in the world, the Seventh-day Adventist Blue Zone in California. Slim, vegetarian, nut-eating, exercising, non-smoking Adventists live about a decade longer than the general population. Their greater life expectancy has been ascribed to these healthy lifestyle behaviors, but there's one lesser-known component that also may be playing a role. Historically, Eating two large meals a day, breakfast and lunch, with a prolonged overnight fast was a part of Adventist teachings. Today, only about 1 in 10 Adventists surveyed were eating just two meals a day, but most, over 60%, reported breakfast or lunch was their largest meal of the day. Though this is yet to be studied with respect to longevity, front-loading one's calories earlier in the day with a prolonged nightly fast has been associated with significant weight loss over time, leading the researchers to conclude that eating breakfast and lunch five to six hours apart and making the overnight fast last you know, 18 to 19 hours may be a useful practical strategy for weight control. The weight may be worth the weight. Now, there was a lot said in that video, which is going to be said a lot more clearly 
in this video, it says, eat more calories in the morning than in the evening. So listen to this and see what you decide to do for yourself. Why are calories eaten in the morning apparently less fattening than calories eaten in the evening? Uh, one reason that more calories are burned off in the morning due to diet-induced thermogenesis. That's the amount of energy the body takes to digest and process a meal, given off in part as waste heat. If you take people and give them the exact same meal in the morning, afternoon, and night, their body uses up about 25% more calories to process it in the afternoon than night, and about 50% more calories to digest it in the morning. Uh, that leaves fewer net calories in the morning to be stored as fat. Um, let's put some actual numbers to it. A group of Italian researchers randomized 20 people to eat the same standardized meal at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m., and then a week later had them all come back to do the opposite. So each person had the chance to eat the same meal uh, for breakfast and for dinner. After each meal, the subjects were placed in a calorimeter contraption to precisely measure how many calories they were burning over the next three hours. The researchers calculated that the meal given in the morning uh, took about 300 calories to digest, whereas the same meal given at night used up only about 200 calories to process. Uh, the meal was about 1,200 calories, but given in the morning, it ended up only providing about 900 calories compared to uh, more like 1,000 calories at night. Same meal, same food, same amount of food, but effectively 100 fewer calories. So a calorie is not just a calorie. It depends on when we eat them. Why do we burn more calories eating a morning meal? I mean, is it behavioral or biological? If you started working the graveyard shift, sleeping during the day and working at night, which meal would net you fewer calories? Uh, would it be the you know, breakfast you had at night uh, before you went to work, or the supper you had in the morning before you went to bed? In other words, is it something about uh, just eating before you go to sleep that causes your body to hold on to more calories? Or is it built in to our circadian rhythm, where we store more calories at night regardless of what we're doing? You don't know until you put it to the test. Harvard researchers randomized people to identical meals at 8 a.m. versus 8 p.m., while under simulated night shifts or day shifts, and regardless of activity level or sleeping cycle, the calories burned processing the morning meals was 50% higher than the evening. So the difference is explained by chronobiology. It's just part of our circadian rhythms to burn uh, more meal calories in the morning. Uh, but like why? I mean, what exactly is going on? How does it make sense for our body to waste calories in the morning uh, when we have the whole day ahead of us? Right? Uh, our body isn't so much wasting calories as investing them. See, uh, when we eat in the morning, our body bulks up our muscles with glycogen, which is uh, the, the primary energy reserve our body uses to fuel our muscles. But this takes energy. In the evening, our body expects to be you know, sleeping for much of the next 12 hours, so rather than storing blood sugar as extra glycogen in our muscles, it preferentially uses it as an energy source, which may end up meaning we burn less of our backup fuel, which is body fat. In the morning, however, our, our body expects to be you know, running around all day, so instead of just burning off breakfast, our body continues to dip into our fat stores while we use breakfast calories to stuff our muscles full of the energy reserves we need to move around over the course of the day. And that's where the inefficiency may come from. The reason it costs more calories to process a morning meal is because instead of just burning glucose, blood sugar, directly, our bodies are instead using up energy to string glucose molecules together into chains of glycogen in our muscles, which are then just going to be you know, broken back down into glucose later in the day. That extra assembly-disassembly step takes energy, energy that your body takes out of your meal, leaving you with fewer calories. 
So in the morning, our muscles are especially sensitive to insulin, rapidly pulling blood sugar out of our bloodstream to build up glycogen reserves. So at night, though, our muscles become relatively insulin resistant. Our muscles resist the signal to take in extra blood sugar. Uh, so does that mean you get a higher blood sugar and insulin spike in the evening uh, compared to eating the exact same meal in the morning? Yes. In that 100 calorie difference study, for example, blood sugars rose twice as high after the 8 p.m. meal compared to the same meal in the morning. So shifting the bulk of our calorie intake towards the morning would appear to have a dual benefit, more weight loss and better blood sugar control. So these videos hopefully will uh, you know, get you to be thinking about when you eat, the time you eat, whether you're going to load more in the morning. Some of you don't want to eat breakfast. I've heard that over and over again by a number of people, including my own kids sometimes, where they're just like, no, I don't eat breakfast. And I, I think to myself, well, I've tried to share the science. I'm going to leave this alone. Let them learn. Uh, over time, because they'll just feel I'm criticizing them if I make too big a deal out of it. But for those of you in this class who are anxious to lose weight, uh, get some additional benefits, uh, uh, hopefully these videos may have piqued your interest. So the question now is, is do you have any questions about any of this? And um, Maybe some of you may want to share your experiences before Scott shows uh, what he's going to show us on the website. Any thoughts? Well, I think it's important to mention that you know maybe some of the terminology in that infographic will, that I'll show in a little bit has some of it. So, so time restricted feeding is another name for some of that a lot of people were thinking intermittent fasting and things but uh time restricted feeding is where you're eating during a window so whether it's eight hour eating window and a 16 hour fasting window or 12 and 12 or whatever you choose to do try to front load it to earlier in the day that gives you most of the weight loss and health benefits and then i think when we talk about fasting you know there's you know, intermittent fasting which is like you know you've fast 24 hours, you know, every other day or every third day or one day a week. There's lots of different ways to do it. And what, you know, I think it's important for this class, we have to talk about how, you know, in general, for the general population, if you're, it's safe to fast for 24 hours, maybe up to 36 hours for, for most people, anything longer than two days, uh, you really need to be under physician uh, supervision. They, they actually have like True North Health Center and, and Santa Rosa, California does therapeutic fasting where they do it for sometimes up to a month. And you have to have, you know, monitor your blood work and have very close observation uh, by medical trained providers for, to do that. But I think it's important also to mention for this class that if anyone's on blood pressure medications or diabetes medications, uh, you really shouldn't do any fasting unless you talk to your medical provider because you could really drop your blood sugar too low or your blood pressure too low. So it's really important. We, you know, we talk about, you know, I think Charlie Yichel has another video that talks more about the benefits of prolonged fasting uh, for weight loss and for other health health benefits. But uh, but I think the kind of the theme, of what the results of the or the wisdom of, or the um, overall summary of, of fasting is it's fasting can have benefits, but it's what you eat after you fast is what's more important. So if you're, you know, eating a standard American diet and you fast for 24 hours or two days or three days with medical supervision, yeah, your blood pressure will drop. Your you can detoxify. You can get lots of health benefits. People with that are really sick with autoimmune diseases really difficult to treat blood pressure, even sometimes cancer patients. There's lots of good data that you can get some health benefits, but it, you know, it's only is going to help you as long as you're doing the fast, which of course nobody can do a fast forever because <laughs> we, we would die, but uh, what, it's what you eat when you refeed is what's the most important thing. So, so if you're still thinking about doing fasting, you want to learn more, 
there is some benefits, but you just have to be careful with, with some of those things with the medications and, and then just kind of remember that it's what you eat when you re when you start eating again, that's the more important thing. So you just go back to your, to the, to a standard American diet, everything's just going to go downhill again. I might add for those of you who are considering doing fasting that you might consider uh, going to uh, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen app and click on his 21 tweaks for weight loss and try that as a first strategy, first step uh, toward your goals. And if you're following his tweaks, uh, you may find success that you haven't had before and not have to subject yourself to more stringent fasting. Just a thought. And someone posted in the chat about, you know, eating uh, more in the morning, it helps your blood sugar. That's true. So think about, I don't know if any of you have diabetes or know somebody with diabetes, a lot of people have really high blood sugars at night or in the first thing in the morning, it's called the dawn phenomenon. And it's basically uh, people a lot of times will have really high blood sugars overnight and in the morning. And that's because as Dr. Greger showed there, you have the muscles are more insulin resistant at night. And that's part of that circadian rhythm thing. So, so when you're uh, the meal you eat later in the evening, it's going to be harder for that, that sugar from that meal in your bloodstream to make it into your muscles because your muscles are less sensitive to the insulin and become more resistant to the insulin. So that's why your, your sugar is stuck in your bloodstream. Whereas in the morning time, your muscles are much more uh, sensitive to insulin and pull in the sugar much more easily. And same with exercise. Exercise will will uh, increase insulin sensitivity and decrease insulin resistance. So uh, so that's another reason if you have diabetes, it's better to eat even, uh, even more. You get not only the weight loss benefits, but also the, the blood sugar control benefits if you eat more earlier in the day versus in the evening. Other questions? I'll show that uh, infographic. Okay. Yeah, go back to the website here. So under resources, if you click resources, and then go to handouts from classes, right here, and then look down, it's right here, fasting infographic. So it's, you can download the PDF. So it's a, it's a good summary of the terminology. So if, as we, you watch these videos, if you're confused about uh, the different types, so calorie restriction, uh, what fasting is, alternate day fasting, 5-2. There's also a fasting mimicking diet, uh, which there's a, Charlie has a video about. Uh, Walter Longo uh, has, has a, from USC, he's a longevity expert from USC, and he has a fasting mimicking diet, which is basically a low calorie plant-based diet. Uh, for certain numbers of days, and it has and it gives you some of the same benefits as fasting. Um, and then here's the time restricted feeding thing. So it has like the pros, advantages, disadvantages of each, and there's some cautions here and stuff. So uh, check if you want to learn more about fasting, just read through read through that. And if you want to see more of the videos, you can go to Gregor's site and do a fasting search or search for fasting, and then in our open forum session, we can potentially play some of those other videos if, if anyone's interested. Um, okay, some more questions. Anybody? First, I have a story for you. The story is I went to a doctor appointment with my wife today. She went to go see an orthopedist to um, she had an uh, area of bursitis or inflammation in her hip, and uh, he injected her hip, and, and uh, she's been having this sort of discomfort for some time. And uh, so he says, yeah, I've had uh, injections before. You know, sometimes there's inflammation that comes up. And I said, so are you eating an anti-inflammatory uh, anti diet? Or, you know, what is in your diet, your personal diet? Well, I guess, yeah, I'm eating some things that may be inflammatory. I said, well, uh, were you aware that uh, 
the meat that you're eating can break down into free radicals and cause inflammation. And at this point, he looked at me like, really? And then I said, and, uh, do you have kids? And he said, yeah. And I said, so do you know the impact that uh, what you eat has on our environment, how raising animals leads to global warming and this? So I gave him my card and referred him to the website. And so my wife was sort of horrified that I kind of jumped in on her appointment time to kind of spread the word to a young orthopedic doctor. Uh, but I sure had fun with it. So <laughs> one person at a time. For any of those of you who are interested in sharing your information with others, you can do it in subtle or not so many, not so subtle ways. <laughs> uh, let's see. So anybody have any anything else they're interested in sharing or any concerns that you've had? Anybody have experience with fasting? Been to True North or done some intermittent fasting on your own and have benefits, or had problems? I've done some fasting. I did it for one day and okay, it, really was, it wasn't really any problem. And I've done, I do try to do intermittent fasting, but I did not realize about the eating that the breakfast versus the dinner. So that's fascinating information. Great. Well, we're glad that you were here to kind of hear that. Yeah. Um, I have a comment um, about yes, Kate. five, six years ago, um, I was unintentionally <laughs> fasting um, just based on my, my class schedule. And, you know, um, seeing those videos was actually really eye opening for me because back then when I was doing it, I was front loading my calories um, and then eating a, you know, medium sized lunch. And then I wasn't eating dinner and I lost a lot of weight. And then when I started eating normally again, once I graduated, I, I gained it all back um, and I didn't really change my diet. I just changed when I was eating. So that's very interesting. That's a very interesting confirmatory story uh, for those of you who have been watching these videos tonight. Huh, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And another thing that, that kind of ties things together is for those of you that were in the, my class I did in lifestyle medicine a few weeks ago, in the sleep health handout under that was one of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Uh, one of the one of the uh, tips on improving sleep is to eat a smaller meal in the evening. And so your so your la your late afternoon early evening meal should be small and a little bit higher in carbohydrate and lower in protein. Whereas your earlier, your meal early in the day should be the larger meal and higher in, in protein. That's why I like, you know, having beans with your, your oatmeal or something or your fruit would be good. Uh, but anyway, so because studies show that for sleep, eating a smaller meal later in the day actually improves sleep. And that just goes back to that same thing, circadian rhythm and whatnot. It's almost like our body. That's what our body wants is to, to eat a little bit smaller later in the day. So it shows how things kind of tie together. Uh, any other thoughts? Okay, it doesn't. Um, new people should look at what Charlie eats in the morning, Kim says. <laughs> yeah, we, we eat a lot. And... Um, I don't know, maybe I could show a picture of that somehow. While you're, if there are any other questions, feel free to speak up. I'm gonna kind of try to look around and see if I can find breakfast for the new people. I think it's here, food pictures. Food. Oh. 
And for those of you that are new, don't let it scare you away because it took it took Charlie and Christine a while to build up to this. So if you're still just eating oatmeal, yeah, we don't want to scare you. <laughs> I, I eat oatmeal for breakfast. I don't I don't eat food that looks like that for breakfast. <laughs> and I've been uh, doing this We 10 started years. out with a, a little leaf of kale. Uh, and then we've progressed over a number of years to eating several leaves of kale and collard greens and maybe chard. And my wife chops up maybe three cups, maybe four cups. It cooks down to about two cups of green, dark green leafies. We have several kinds of fruit. This is for our dog. Uh, let's see. What else? Um, huh. I can't. So we put it all in a bowl. And on the bowl, sometimes it can go in a plate. We have some broccoli oftentimes. Here's the steamed greens, a little touch of garlic, maybe some fresh fruit of different kinds. We try to eat the colors of the rainbow. And then we will eat a bowl of cereal, either groats or groats and kamut, or just oatmeal is what we started with, with some fruit. These are other pictures, which we'll get into in some other session. But I guess I wanted to just show you that we eat uh, fruit, vegetables, we add beans uh, serving here, and then we have the whole grains that go along with, with our breakfast. So we kind of follow what Dr. Greger is recommending. Um, and we're pretty stuffed and full. It's such a big meal that we probably don't eat again until about five o'clock. We eat about maybe 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. And then we don't eat anything uh, after 5, 30, 6 o'clock is um, no more food until the following morning. Okay, that's the quick summation. You don't have to eat that way. Uh, you can get by with just some cereal and maybe a little fruit, but uh, I find it kind of hard to get in a few servings of beans a day unless we start out. I, I, we started this because of Dr. Uh, Esselstyn and uh, trying to prevent heart disease. So we had some uh, steamed greens at some event that I can't remember in Portland and we thought, man, this tastes pretty good. So we've kind of carried on that tradition. All right, any other questions? We still have about 10 minutes or so. We could stop early or we could keep going. I have a oh, question. Yeah, go ahead, Lori. So, I mean, for years I had, cause I do my street steamed greens and all that stuff in the morning and mushrooms and whatever. And I used to put beans in there and then I got hooked on the edamame. So I've been putting edamame in there instead of the beans. I have lots of beans for, for lunch and dinner, but for breakfast, I've been doing the edamame. What do you think? I think that's a good thought, because good suggestion for everyone because soy can be a, uh, it's a legume and it's in the same uh, bean category as pintos or black beans or any of that. And a variety of different beans may have some differing uh, chemicals which help in different ways. It's been shown that those who are eating um, maybe three to five servings of soy a day have a lower risk of recurrence of breast cancer and longer longevity, for example. So having some soy in your diet like that is, is a helpful choice. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, exactly. And mommy is great. It's that the healthiest version of soy. It's the whole soy bean. So that's great. And, and tempeh would be the next best because it's got chunks of whole soy beans in it too. And it's fermented. So, so that would, I'd put that higher. Those two would be higher than even tofu. I bet tofu is great as well. But I would put tofu in third place when you're choosing soy products. And edamame is number one. And I have a question for you, Scott, about your... Um... Is it um, the supplement? Mm -hmm. 
the, the iodine. Iodine. Yeah. So yeah. where do you get that? And I just I bought just... it on Amazon. It was okay. just a kelp. Yeah, kelp su supplement iodine. Okay, I, I was that. I, I was looking that up on Amazon. I was just curious if that's where you were getting it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's where I got it. Thanks. I had a patient a couple weeks ago uh, who actually I had him several months ago um, where he was, he had, there was a suspicion that he had low thyroid. His TSH was elevating and uh, one of the doctors wanted to put him on thyroid medication and I quizzed him about iodine. He didn't seem to have much. And so I said, well, put yourself on iodine. We'll repeat your tests in about a month. They all came back normal. He was just not getting enough iodine in his diet. All right, any other questions? It doesn't have to be on fasting. It could be on anything. I used to be on low, um, low blood sugar. No, yeah, low blood sugar. And um, I don't know what caused it, but I'm always worried about that I will, because no meat and so on, I'm on a whole plant food diet for a whole year now. And I haven't had the low blood sugar yet. So I'm surprised that normally the meat would bring up my blood sugar, you know? So um, I'm surprised that I did not have any low blood sugar at all. No problem with it. But I don't eat the beans anymore because I, my stomach can't handle it. Okay, so uh, you're eating the fuel for your body. So you don't yeah. get hypoglycemic episodes. I don't eat uh, the, the flour or the sugar as much, just the sugar in the, in the dates or in the grapes or something like that, but not, I have no sugar in the house. So Great. Uh, that makes a lot of difference apparently. I didn't think it would, but it does apparently. Well, thanks for sharing that. Any thoughts from anyone else? <clears throat> this is good information. I'm trying to gain weight. So when I get off the show tonight, I'm going to eat a 830 cat, 830 uh, cat meal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you're eating your calories mainly in the morning, have you been doing that? I eat uh, three regular space meals. They're all, yeah, I try to get uh, 830 calories a meal three times a day. I see. So if you weighted a, uh, the calories a little bit more in the evening, you might gain weight, actually. For yeah, you. hopefully. <laughs> uh, that's uh, uh interesting scenario. Charlie, that didn't work for me. I eat a big meal at night so I can go to sleep. It's yeah. exactly the opposite. But I take like uh, oatmeal or something, uh, uh, carbohydrate. And either my brain is working overtime and I can't sleep or else I go to sleep. It depends. So um, it's interesting that I need a lot more calories at night. And I'm staying the same level. I lost a little bit of weight, but it's no big deal. I'm still, you know, in the same level. I'm not skinny, you know. So yeah. um, it's no problem, you know. So, but uh, usually in the morning I eat a big meal and then lunch a little bit of snack. Uh, sometimes another meal. And in the evening, a big one. Or sometimes a snack in the evening. It depends. And... It's no problem, you know, I never gain weight and never, well, I'm very active though. So um, the other day I got 11,000 steps. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Plus, right. yeah, a little more than that. So yeah, um, I have more of a problem gaining weight, but uh, it's no problem. I don't need to get fat and I don't need to be skinny. So yeah, it's just right. Good. Uh, Kim, 
you got your hand raised was that from before or no I, I had a question so i've been a lifelong vegetarian and um when in my 40s i was diagnosed as um having an underactive thyroid and i'm wondering now talking about this if that was because i wasn't having any sea vegetables and i was i've never been a salt person so do you think that I've had to have some thyroid because I didn't have enough salt and iodine in my diet before. And it could, it could be, and, and it depends. Are you taking a very low dose of thyroid now? I am, but my doctor wanted me to go higher. I think I told you, and I started taking the iodine and they checked my, my, my levels and I don't need to go higher. I mean, I'm not, I'm still on it, but I, I take the, uh, the kelp, the, um, the drops mm. that I got at whole foods and or sprouts. And that seems to do the trick. So, but I'm just wondering if maybe my deficiency is a long-term thing because I haven't had um, sea vegetables and salt with iodine in my diet. Well, Probably. I don't know if it would persist if it was truly a, a iodine deficiency. Uh, depends on where your thyroid functions are now. If they're at the uh, upper end of normal and yet normal, it's possible by you incorporating iodine that maybe you could discontinue that and be in the normal range still for yourself. So that might be something you wanna explore with your doctor since you were not taking iodine, now you are, you're in the normal range. If it's the low normal, then the argument would be, well, you probably get too low, but still for a trial for a month or two, uh, if you wanted to experiment, uh, with your doctor on board with that. I don't see a major issue with that. You're not gonna keel over uh, because of a month or two trial of, of uh, reducing the dose that you're taking now. Maybe you could even reduce it to half. Something that you could discuss. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Scott, we're within two or three minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, another session. Yeah. Next week, I'm going to talk about life, lifestyle medicine pioneers. I'm going to uh, talk about some of the pe people whose shoulders we, Charlie and I, stand on and kind of some of the history of this. I think it's important to honor the those that came before us that had to tread, tread you know, up a steeper hill than we are. I mean, we feel like we're, you know, having to swim upstream a little bit here getting spreading this message to the medical community and to the community itself but uh, it was much much more s swifter currents for the people the generation that came before us so I, I like to pay homage to them it's a fun talk next week i encourage you to come uh and um we look forward to meeting with all of you. And uh, if you have some questions, we'll probably be able to answer a few next week also. Charlie, I have a question. Go is ahead, Proudy. This is a good book to read. I got another one. Uh, I've never read that. I, uh, Scott, are you uh, no. familiar with it? Mm -mm. Who, who wrote that one? Mark Hyman. I think Mark Hyman is a low carb person. Yeah, so I'd be careful about. Um, no, I don't go for that no more. Probably they want a lot of, uh, lot of uh, protein and all that. Right. And that's what right. got me heart surgery. I'm not going for that yeah, anymore. Wouldn't, wouldn't go that route. It doesn't affect me. I I get off from that. So if you want, if you want to know about brain health and out preventing Alzheimer's, you want the. Alzheimer's Solution by Dean and Aisha Shirzai. That's on the book list on the website. That's the one you want. So they're whole food plant-based. They're a married couple. They're neurologists. Down. Here, I'll, I'll show you on the website. It's on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's on the website. <laughs> what is uh, it called? Yeah, well, he, he's going to get it on here and you can take a picture of it with your smartphone. Let's go back here. It doesn't work for me. I need to write things down. Okay, well, he's he's coming up with it so you can right see here. it on the screen so, here. So resources list, links to books. There's all a bunch of books. I love the read. 
scroll down. So if you want something about dementia and Alzheimer's, recommend this one right here, The Alzheimer's Solution by Dr. Dean and Aisha Shirzai. I've seen them speak on multiple occasions. Actually, they were just at the at the uh, uh, conference I was just at in Palm Springs. What, just what is couple, it? Two weeks ago. The Alzheimer's Solution, right, Dr. right down the screen. Doctor Dean. Aisha, sure is I. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> Ayesha. Yeah. Uh huh. Shirzai. Shirzai. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to ask that for the library and try to see if I can read that. Okay. Um, yeah. It, I, I like a lot of information and I had enough that I don't want to clog up anymore, you know? So yeah. I yeah. got to about it yeah that's so you gotta be careful who you uh who you, you trust you know we have we have to you know i know we, 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 we trust the nutritionfacts.org <laughs> that's the science right you can't yeah. you're you're yeah. playing with fire if you just go buy some random book that that you saw on yeah. a commercial or on a tv it's show or something really like that just waste the time but other than that i wouldn't go for it anyway oh, i'm okay. convinced that the plant diet is the best so okay well, we're going to sign off and next week uh, we look forward to seeing you all again and hope you have a good one. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Good night. Good night, good night. everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs>